Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time to be here. We've got one pages of notes, or one page of notes. And we're going to introduce the uh, final chapters of Romans today, uh, beginning in Romans 12, going up through uh, the end of 15, or end of chapter 15. There's a closing chapter, chapter 16. <clears throat> but this is a, a big break right here as we begin chapter 12 in Paul's letter of the Romans. So far, as you see in the notes, we'll talk about the words indicative and imperative. Uh, the moods of the verbs have been so far basically indicative. They've been doctrinal. They've been uh, theological. It's Paul making a theological argument, a theological explanation. He's establishing some truths. Uh, so it's indicative. Indicative, if you notice on your notes, it's the second bullet point down. Indicative is the mood of reality. It indicates the verb really happened, or at least it really happened in the mind of the speaker. Uh, this is the mood of the verbs that Paul uses in his doctrinal chapters, uh, chapters 1 through 11. So we have a lot of information there, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Remember him talking about God making himself known to mankind through creation? Indicative. It's nothing you've got to do, it's just the facts. Uh, talk about the sinfulness of man and man's reaction to God in chapters 2 and 3. The facts. He eventually gets into talking about righteousness is attained through Jesus Christ. It's the facts. It's, it, it's what God's plan is. It's doctrine. It's explaining the whole plan of God to us in chapters 1 through 11, including those last three chapters we spent a lot of time in, chapters 9, 10, 11, talking about God choosing Israel and how he can set them aside, begin something new, but yet still at the same time be fulfilling his promises to Israel, ultimately coming about in the end when Israel is jealous of what takes place in the Gentile age or the age of the church and they see something and they turn back to the Lord, and there's all Israel's being saved. That's all information. It's in the indicative mood. Well, indicative mood. What happens here in chapter 12 now is nothing different than what we see in some other letters of Paul's, as I've got read here. It's transition. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We can look there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, is where he now begins that truth that you've been given, the truth that you've come into fellowship with God. You've been made righteous in Christ. It's a positional truth. You, you, you don't have to do anything to deserve it. You now are in relationship. You've got the right standing with God. But now that you are righteous in Christ, it becomes now, it moves into the imperative mood, which is, as you notice in your notes, the voice of command. Now that you are, now that you understand what's going on, now that you understand you're not righteous in yourself, you are sinful, separated from God, an enemy of Christ, but you've been brought into right standing with God through Jesus Christ, He's transformed you. He's given you his spirit. He's given you his word. He's given you new life. He's placed you in the kingdom of light, taking you out of the kingdom of darkness. Now that you are a member of this new kingdom, this future kingdom, how do you live now? Now comes the imperative. These are now commands. And I'm going to break them down here as I hope I get through this today, just kind of in a review. Uh, the renewing of the mind. You mean begin to think correctly. Uh, the diversity of gifts, he explains the gifts, and you should understand that each of us has a different part in this body of believers called the church. Uh, the demand for love. Now that you have come into fellowship with Jesus Christ, he has everything under control. You are now free to cooperate. Not live a selfish life, but live a life of love. And it's, it's in an imperative mode. Live a life of love. Now, now you see, that's so confusing. Love. Well, that's what every, it's all about love. No, 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 we're not talking about 21st century, millennial, you know, whatever we're living now, the snowflake love, just put up with all kinds of stupidity. We've renewed our minds. We're thinking in reality. But in love now, you're not living selfishly. You're not living for, you're still living in tune with truth. You're still separating darkness from light. There is wrong and there is right. There is a fictional unreality and there is the reality that God created. We're not... We're not just dismissing all absolutes. See, it's almost like in this postmodern age, love means we dismiss all reality. There's no absolutes. It's whatever you just create your own. No, if you are wrong living in darkness, you're wrong living in darkness. But this love means we are no longer existing here on this earth for ourselves. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to do the things that we're responsible for. We'll talk about all those things. But now we need to love and be able to work with others. Not, well, we see that, and we just started Philippians. We see that's going to be a big theme through the book of Philippians on Tuesday night, is not promote yourself above others, but begin to serve others for the benefit of the whole. First, the benefit of the body of Christ. You have a part, you have a gift, 
And those gifts are wide and varied. Sometimes they seem to be conflicting, but they're, they're coming, they're, they're things just like parts of your body seem to be conflicting, you know, but they're all working together for one purpose. But you need unity, love, functioning together. And then we come down here, the next part, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, love is actually the fulfillment of the law. The law of the Old Testament, in, in a sense, is just rules and regulations on how Israel's supposed to live. If you can learn to live in love, in unity, working for the well-being of everybody, uh, that, that, that's the point of the law. The law was to get everybody together in one community, functioning as a nation, functioning as a unit. Uh, love will fulfill that law. And that's, that's chapter 13. Uh, awake and waiting for the Lord, meaning we are. What do we do? Here's this tension that's going to be throughout these chapters. Is now that you, and it's kind of set the stage for something that's going to come up that's going to be a big thing in, in these next chapters. Is now that we are waiting for a king from heaven, Jesus is going to return. That's part of the doctrine. He left, he will be back, he will establish his kingdom on the earth, and we're part of that future kingdom. We've been born again, we are a new creature in Christ. So, how do we now live here in this age at this time? with these people, with this government, with this culture, with this society, while well, really committed to this future kingdom that's a greater kingdom that's going to dismiss all of this. And that's going to come into here. We are awake and waiting. We, we anticipate his return, but you still have to be responsible here. You have a place at this time in history for this time. And he'll address that. And then we get into this right here. Food and it's a long group. It's a long ch section. Chapter fourteen, verse one, chapter through fifteen, verse thirteen. It's food. It's the dietary laws. It's the Jewish dietary laws. And Paul goes off and basically, it's 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 a very interesting set of verses. He's going to call some people strong. He's going to call some people weak. And the strong people, if we get to this, are going to be those who understand. Well, chapters one through eleven, the imperative or the indicative. The, this is the facts. They're living this life in the imperative, and they understand food really isn't the issue. Eating this or not eating that has nothing to do with your spiritual standing with God. It was a dietary law of the Jews. So if you understand that, you're strong in faith. So there are others that are still weak. They're still feel, they still feel guilty. They still eat something that was illegal or considered unclean. It's like, oh, no, God's mad at me. He's upset with me because I've, I've eaten something unclean. It's like... No, that, that's, no, 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 don't think like that. Well, some people do. So they, in a sense, are weak. They stumble over things they shouldn't, that, that's not something you stumble over. You just keep right on going. That's not an issue. This is an interesting set of verses because it establishes the concept that there are some things that are issues. Some things that you've got to walk away from. You cannot go there. And there are other things, they're not issues. They're things people get caught up in. And Paul, these are Paul's words, not mine. The strong in faith, those who understand can walk right by the non-essential. It's like, that's not important. And they walk by. But you have to realize there are some people that are weak in the faith that really don't understand these things. They're tripping and stumbling over things and feeling guilty about it. It's like, that's a non-issue. But you can't just tell them that's a non-issue. You know, get up here. You've got to slow down and you've got to be concerned. Go right back to this. That he may end for love. More concerned about them. You can't just laugh at them and say, oh, well, that's stupid. You need to catch up. It's like, well, they can't because they're stuck on this issue of in this case, eating foods that were sacrificed to an idol. And I, I ate, a, ate a piece of meat that was, had been sacrificed to Zeus in the temple of Zeus. And now it was sold in the marketplace. And this is what they did. They'd offer meat to the, the, the gods in the temples. They'd have all this meat left over. The gods really didn't show up and eat it, you know. And so they'd take it out and they'd sell it in the marketplace because it's good steak. And so people would come by and buy it. And Paul apparently was eating the steak that came out of the temples. Like, I'll just grill it and eat it at home. It's like... That was offered to Zeus. It's like, you, what? That's not for Paul, non-issue. But if he's at someone's house having a picnic or something, or eating something, and they're saying, that was offered to Zeus, he'd say, oh, big deal to you? Oh, yeah, we can't eat. Oh, well, then I'll just have the salad, please. And so, in other words, he was, like, he was going to act in love. He knew it wasn't an issue, but because he's helping wait for other people to catch up, he would lay it down, and he'd go ahead, and, and that's that issue right there. Now, I would like to... From this, come over. All these are taught other places. For example, renewing of the mind, the concept of thinking new thoughts, understanding of new reality, <laughs> Ephesians. Uh, the diversity of gifts, clearly 1 Corinthians 12, again in Ephesians 4. 
The demand for love, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, the love fulfills the law. That's taught in Galatians. Uh, awake and waiting for the Lord, meaning what do we do? We're waiting for Jesus to come for that future age. we still got to be responsible. Paul's telling the Thessalonians the same thing here. And the dietary discussion is 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. It's the same discussion. So, looking at this list, it appears Paul is just reciting possibly. I mean, we, we got to think now, what is Paul doing here? Is this right here is just a reciting potentially of just some Christian ethics based on the concept of his doctrine, his theology of chapters 1 through 11. If this is all true, and you are this new people, then these are your new ethic, your new guidelines. This is how you live. These are the things, your mind, the gifts, the love, fulfilling the law, waiting for the Lord, yet being responsible, and understanding people are on different levels of faith and understanding. You can't mock them. You've got to help them along. Sometimes go back to get them. And this is what he's doing, basic Christian ethics. So it's nothing different, nothing new here, except it's all kind of put together in one place. There is one thing that is new. This is, uh, if you, it's, it's not new, new, but it's interesting. It's the, that if you look down there, it's the third big black bullet point from the bottom. Then you go down all those little circles. It's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh one there. And it says the issue that Paul addresses here that is not directly addressed somewhere else in other writings is Romans 13, 1 through 7. So that is, and that's not, that's, I don't have it listed here. It's not addressed anywhere else in Paul's writings. It's chapter 13, 1 through, did I say 11 or 7? 7. 1 through 7. And that is the government. That is the state. And that is how do we deal with the government? Again, kind of coming on this issue of this right here, awake and waiting. And you see, it's kind of tied together. I see this 13, 11 through 14, right before we get to this awake and waiting for the Lord. You're going to have this section here, not duplicated in Ephesians or Corinthians or Colossians or anywhere else. But Paul's saying specifically, the government is there, established by God, to help you. It's there. It is not something you fight. The government is not something you rebel against. It's not... And again, the classic case, I was teaching a long time ago to a school, a high school Christian class, and uh, uh, a kid said, well, the government, that's evil. The government, that's, we shouldn't have a government. We should all be free. This is, de this is a democracy gone crazy on steroids. We, should all, we all should do in America. We all get to do what we want. Uh, it's like, what, what history class have you been sitting in? It's like, we should all do what we want to. The government is just here to interfere with us. And I said, well, well, wait a minute. No. And I took it to a couple of verses. I said, no, the government, and we go back to Noah's flood, we go back to Genesis, and all these institutions are established. Government was established to protect man from other men so that you could come together and have rules and regulations. Government is established by God for the well-being of people, just like parents and family are established by God for the well-being of people. It is not now, again, can families, can parents, can dads be evil? Yes, but that doesn't mean the position of dad is evil. Can governments be evil and corrupt? Yes, but that doesn't mean the position of government can be cor it is corrupt. It was established by God. And so Paul begins to address government here in chapter 13, telling the people, you need to submit. They're, they're servants established by God to serve you, to provide for you. And you fight against the government, you're going to find yourself getting punished. He says the government doesn't bear the sword in vain. It's there to destroy, to put down the lawbreakers. And so Paul never addresses that anywhere else, which throws up a flag here that we ask, why is he putting it in here? Is he just completing his list? Maybe. We don't know exactly why it's there. Maybe he's just rounding off his list. Because remember, this is being written in 57 AD. He's got He's got books like Philippians. He's still got uh, 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 Colossians. He's still got First, or, yeah, First, Second Timothy. He's got right. I mean, there's other things that are going to be written. So this is not like his final work. But he does mention government, which may be just again. This is just something worth considering. This may be an issue the Roman Church is dealing with in the midst of the head of the Roman Empire in Rome itself. As you know, there have been Jews that are are in the Jewish in the Christian Church in Rome. 
And this is 57 AD that this book is being written from Corinth. Sometime in 48 AD, the Jews had been expelled from Rome. They had been kicked out of Rome because, well, they had too many rights. And so the Jews had been, ex you know, well, that's where uh, Aquila and Priscilla had been court. Uh, they'd, been, they'd been expelled during uh, Caligula's reign. Now, by 57 AD, there's a new emperor, and that, that law is kind of passed away. You know, a new executive order has been written and renounced the other executive order and all. You, you're, you're familiar with this discussion. And so the Jews began trickling back in. In fact, they were, they were part of the church. They are part of the church. And yet, there was this, this probably this animosity with the Jews. because They had already been expelled because of their own rights in the synagogues, because of Crestus, which is probably because of Christ. Uh, and then the Christians who were now repenting and coming to this new faith, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord, and now you've got this tension between this future kingdom, the Jews are already at odds with the Roman government, and they're all kind of pooling together, and now what about the government? We don't need the government, we should have our own government, we should do our own, it's like Paul says, is he just puts a, shuts that down and says no, the government was established by God for this time period in history. You can still be a Christian, you can still operate in faith, you can still do the things God requires you to do, and still operate under the government. Now, Paul does not address this anywhere else specifically, but who else has? Jesus did. They ask him, who, who should we pay taxes to Caesar? He says, give me a coin. Whose image is on this coin? Caesar's. Well, it's Caesar's coin. He's, he's building your roads, he's protecting you with the military. Caesar is taking care of your government, so he wants some money back. You give to Caesar what is Caesar. There's nothing wrong with paying government taxes to an institution on earth. Well, what about God? Well, God's not taxing you. He's asking you for other things other than taxation. He's asking you for, well, look at the list here. Give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, you can function in the government in Rome in 57 AD and still be a Christian. Peter also addresses this because Christians begin to come under persecution by the time Peter writes, you know, it's 62, 64 A.D. You see that you're a little bit later. And he's writing from Rome. And he says, if you're going to do good, and look at this list. Just because you're anticipating Jesus Christ, just because you're anticipating another kingdom, doesn't mean you check out of this world. Doesn't mean you stop paying your taxes. Doesn't mean you stop helping society. Doesn't mean you stop taking care of the planet. Doesn't mean you stop whatever. You still participate in, because this is the world we live in. But some people look at that and say, well, we're waiting for another king, so we're out of here. Peter says, no, if you do these things, who is going to want to harm you? If you were, this is Peter's point. He says, if you're being persecuted, make sure it's, you're being persecuted because of Jesus Christ and because of the word. Don't be persecuted because you're a criminal. He says, there's no honor in the kingdom of God. Basically, we go and study it. There's no honor in being persecuted because you're a Christian criminal. In fact, Paul would agree, if you're a Christian criminal, you belong in prison, or you belong getting fined, penalized. Christians should be doing good in their societies. Yeah, you're waiting for Jesus Christ. Yes, you believe all mankind are sinners. Yes, we believe faith only come, only, a salvation only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't affect the fact that you can interact with people and be good and do these things that are good and beneficial for yourself for your church, for your community. And if you are, who's going to want to hurt you? Now, if they actually come against the faith, we have the apostles' example on the, on the Temple Mount at the very beginning of Acts. They call them in. They says, we want you to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's a different situation. Because there is over the government from the very beginning, there is God who's over all. And God says, you do these things, but you also proclaim Christ. You also go to all the world. You name the name of Jesus. You don't compromise salvation by faith in Jesus. You don't compromise the word. And if men come to you and say, stop preaching in Christ, you say the same thing the apostle said to the leader on the Sanhedrin on the Temple Mount. Well, who should we obey, God or men? When God and government require the same thing, like something that is both Christian and morally ethical, not a problem. But when the government says, we, we don't want you to do this particular thing, say, preach in Jesus Christ or claim the word of God to be the truth, 
then you're going to decide, are you going to stand with God or are you going to stand with the government? And in that case, the right choice would be you stand with God. You don't burn down the government, but you do realize the government is going to come and persecute you. That's, I mean, that's, who should we, when they say, who should we obey, God or man, the apostles were saying, we're going to have to take a brain check on this. We can't stop preaching the name of Christ. We're going to continue to preach the name of Christ. And you will probably come and kill us. But that's the way it's going to be. If they didn't say, well, we don't get to preach the name of Christ. We're going to burn down your government. We're going to riot in the streets. It's just, no, when you decide to serve God over government, you realize all the way through from the book of Genesis to the very end, the government, who would then be in rebellion towards God, is going to come and get you. They're going to penalize you. They're going to put you in jail. They're going to execute you. They'll begin to persecute the believers. So then that means we should riot against the government. That's, that is never one of the ethics, that to riot against your government. And Paul's going to be addressing that. And that gives the impression that might have been something that was kind of interesting or something that the, the Romans were concerned about. Okay, let's go back to the notes very quickly. And then I want to read through some of these things. So if you look at the notes again, I've said at the very beginning that this is a transition. He's going from the doctrinal points into the application. And many of these applications that he's pointing out are going to be repeated or have already been mentioned in other places. Um, you can see, again, Ephesians and Thessalonians and other books, a very similar thing. He spends, like in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, establishing doctrinal principles, truths, uh, in, in, in the indicative mode. And then beginning in chapter 4, he begins saying, okay, here's if you're a parent, how you should live. If you're a husband, this is how you should live. If you're an employee, this is how you should live. He starts giving you rules or uh, uh, commands on how you should live out the Christian life. And that's typical. <laughs> I do have there under the imperative mode, I uh, do have two places that we find the imperative mode in chapters 1 through 11. That's in chapter 6 and chapter 11. And we will be able to go through these chapters, 12, 13, and 14, and kind of see how they kind of parallel with some things that take place in chapter 6 in, in Roman. Because even there, Paul talks about if this is the case, then you're going to have to start living a, a righteous life. In, in, in the world. Another thing that's interesting uh, is that Nick's point down is, a, I write note, the indicative and the imperative are not two phases of the Christian life. We talk about the phase of Christianity. I wrote the book, uh, The Word. Uh, you can, you know, you talk about the f different phases of your Christian life of past, present, and future of salvation. The indicative and the imperative modes, you've got to continually return to the, in in the indicative, the truths, to establish those truths in your life to find the power to do these things here. If you just start to listen, here's what happens to a lot of Christians, a lot of churches. They rush right into chapters 12, 13, and 14. We're going to start doing, we're going to have a lot of love in this church. We're going to have a lot of love in this church. And they've skipped chapters 1 through 11 because they're boring and no one's interested. <laughs> okay, that's part of where renewing the mind comes in. If you don't know chapters 1 through 11, if you don't understand God's plan, you don't understand what God's doing, you can't just jump in and say, we're the church of love. If you're not a church of chapters 1 through 11, you're not going to be a chap church of chapters 12, 13, and 14, and 15. You just can't do it. You're now just tapping right. You're just going from, jumping from the what? You say the frying pan to the fire? You're just jumping from, from being a sinner into being now a sinner trying to do good things. You've got to renew. You've got to get saved renew your mind, and find that transformation power of the Spirit, the renewing of the mind through the Word of God, and that new not life in Christ should begin living this way. Otherwise, you just got a bunch of pagans trying to act like they're Christians. And so, so many churches are, are happy with that. We just have banners hung up about love. We're a, a church that's focused on our community. Yeah, do you know anything about what God is? And oh, well, God is good. God is love. God loves everyone. Okay, well, what do you mean by that? Well, God's not judgmental. It's like, Okay, wait, you're, you're starting, well, have you read chapters 1 to, no, no one's really interested in chapters 1 through 11 of Romans. We're just here to love people. It's like, okay, you're not a church. You're a community organization that's using names from the scriptures to do what you want to do. So, note, the indicative and imperative are not two phases. You're continually, you're in the imperative, or yeah, in, indicative where you're getting information, and that information is renewing your mind, and you're implementing it in your life. If you try to get stuck over here just in this application and you start separating yourself from the information, the knowledge, the truths, those realities that have been stated, 
You're going to start losing out on the grace, the mercy. You're going to start doing this in your own effort. You're going to start making up your own rules and guidelines. And it's going to become, well, dead in the water. It's going to become human works. So you've got to continually have that refreshing of the truth while you apply these, these things to your life. Another bullet point right after that says the word righteousness is, it's interesting. It, from here, right here, at the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1, the word righteousness, which is the theme of the book of Romans, is not used except one more time in chapter 14, verse 17, where it talks about that more in the sense of righteous being an act that you present before men of, of peace, of righteousness, of these. It helps, it falls in this category of righteous deeds done before men. So it's interesting. Righteousness is what God has given you through Jesus Christ, the big theme of chapters 1 through 11. But now, now that you are righteous, here's the things you're doing. These are just things to point out. Uh, so basically, I've got the second bullet point from the bottom chapter. Uh, it says, uh, the, the res this book is basically about how Christians, how you, us, how we interact with other believers, how we interact with society, which would be unbelievers, but also unbelievers who are hostile to the Christian faith, and how you interact with the government or the state. So how you interact as, a, as, as Christians, how you interact with unbelievers or society, how you interact with the government that you're operating under. And again, churches, believers operate under their local government. You're never, set, never in, Christ, in, in, in the scriptures is the church separated from the government. We're, we're outside. We're a new creature in Christ. Not at this time because the God that you made you a new creature has still got you in time under the government that you're serving. So figure it out from there. Well, they're, they're against Christianity. Well, you're going to have to continue to be a Christian and the re repercussions are going to be not that you take over the government, but possibly that you get persecuted by the government. And that is the way the Bible ends. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at chapter uh, 12. <clears throat> I'd like to just kind of go through these right here so you can see these. Uh, next week, we're going to start in chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and break down these words. Uh, again, it's a, it's, I wrote the, the book. Uh, how, why don't you know what the word name of the book is? It's the word, the, the what is it? Apparatus. 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 For salvation, uh, for salvation renewal, and maturity. and maturity. Thank you. It was a great book. <laughs> but it's, it's based on this concept of the word renews your mind, and it's what helps you get to the place of salvation renewing of the mind and maturity so that you're producing good works. And here it is. This is one of the key verses here. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, again, we'll talk about this more next week, but you see the word therefore. That's a transition word. Because of basically, now some would say, because therefore means because of what's gone before. So like chapters 9, 10, 11, it could be just limited to those chapters 9, 10, 11. But because of the drastic change from the, like we said, the indicative into the imperative, from everything's being about righteous to now it's all application. I think it's safe. I mean, this is not a slam dunk. You've got to think about it. I think when he says, therefore, he's doing this right here. He's Ephesians 4, verse 1, therefore. I spent three chapters giving you doctrine, information, and now, therefore, this is how you live. 1 Thessalonians 4, the same thing. This is information. Now this is what I want you to do. So I think right here he's now giving them all of his doctrine. And now he's into, what are we going to do with that now? Besides just sitting together and having church meetings and talking about what we believe, this is what you should do. This is your, what your life should look like. Therefore, I urge you, again, that's a key word right there, I urge you, which is a, it's basically a command, but it's a, it's a nice command. It's, it's, a, it's command with a please in front of it. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'll talk about this next week. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now that you've received these good things from God, chapters 1 through 11, how do you respond? Well, you begin to live this way. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Again, that could refer to philosophies, worldviews, lifestyles of this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? How? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. That's a great verse. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, if you do not renew your mind, if you do not let this information saturate your soul, transform your thinking, uh, you're going to be making stuff up. 
And you will not, you'll have emotions, you'll have feelings, you'll have past examples, but you won't be able to look at the information and evaluate what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. You'll have to go, well, I feel God's will is. I prayed and I felt the Spirit led me. It's like there's a place for all of that, but that's not what Paul's talking Paul's talk about here. You will now be able to, with this information, you begin to think, don't think like the world, think like this new creation, this word of God, this new position about this new kingdom. Now you'll be able to look at it from this vantage point and be, oh, I see now, that's not what we want to do. This is what God wants us to do. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Not by feeling it, by, but by simply analyzing it, saying, hmm. It's a lot more intellectual than people want it to be. But I want God to give me a vision. He gave you, this, look, this is 6,000 years of information recorded in scriptures called the inspired word of God. Well, I want a vision. Well, try reading this first, and then if you got this all taken care of, maybe God can start talking like you're Daniel or somebody. Otherwise, it's already been written down for you. Well, I just want, verse 3. For by God's grace given me, I say to every one of you, now right here, for by God's grace given me, that's that first part right there, renewing of the mind, now goes to the diversity of gifts. This first section here, or I guess the second section now, would be about gifts. This is all about, we talk about the church, each believer in the church having some part, some spiritual, some again are, are more lofty, some would say, but everybody has a place. There's no extra Christians in the body of Christ. And Paul says this, and by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. And that grace given him is no longer, we're not talking about salvation grace. We're talking about this grace gift, big word in 1 Corinthians 12, grace, charis, the gift. It was given to him. He didn't earn it or deserve it. He is by grace an apostle. So by, by the grace given him, he's writing as an apostle. He says to each one of you, gives him a command, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, look at yourself in the mirror, not with human arrogance, not with, well, I think I can do this better, or here's what I would like to do. No. Step back and think of yourself, what has God given you to contribute to the church? What, what is your place in the church? Think of it, it says again, uh, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Well, I'd like to be the head of the church. I would like to be... I would like to be very, I'd like to have my picture in the building of the church. I would like to have the church named after. It's like, no, oh, what, 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 seriously, really, what is your gift? Well, I think you can be anything. No, you can't be anything you want to be. God's already determined that that's one of those fellows. We got a little book we read our grandson. I can be anything I want to be. I read it to him. We enjoy it. But I cringe every time I read it. Because, no, you can't be anything you want to be. It, 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 right here, by the great, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Because you can't be anything you want to be. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Think about it. In accordance with the measure of faith God has already given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. And Paul begins to say, by the grace given me, I tell you. I'm giving you information. Why? Well, because I'm an apostle, this is my place. I'm just smarter than everybody. No, I'm an apostle. This is my role. And so now you decide, find out what your place is by the grace given you. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy. If his gift is if, if, in proportion with his faith, if it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it, if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. I mean, there's a, again, there's a list of gifts rattled off right there. Not a complete list, but you combine that with what you see in chapter 12, what you see in Ephesians 4 and other places. And that I don't even think we have a, an extensive list in the scriptures, but we can, and we'll talk about that one. But there it is. Find your place. Find your place in the body. First of all, renew your mind. Next, find your gift. What, what are you? Uh, it, it doesn't need to be something big and showy. It doesn't need something that someone's got to, your name's got to be listed in the bulletin with a title after it. What if it's showing mercy? What your name and then giver of mercy. If it's encouraging, it's like your name somewhere listed and encouraging. It, or encourage, it's like go here for encouragement. It's going to surface. Your gift will surface somewhere, and it does, it's not going to happen in church necessarily between the time it opens and it closes on a Sunday. It's going to happen. In your Christian life. It's going to happen outside of the church. It's going to happen because 
You are a child of God. You are a member of the body of Christ. It's going to manifest in different places. It might manifest at work, with your family, with your friends, out for coffee, play somewhere you're out, you know, driving somewhere on vacation. It's going to start to manifest. <laughs> and, of course, churches want it to be in some kind of a, a club or a committee or an outreach program and a title, and you have to meet on Thursday nights to get everybody together. It's like you're, you're killing the thing. You're, you're, you're organizing the thing to death. Just teach and get out of the way. Anyway, this is bigger than a lot of committees. Anyway, next one, verse 9. You can probably have in your Bibles maybe even a title. Mine in NIV right here just says love. It adds the word love, a little title there. We've now switched now the demand for love. Love must be sincere. Oh, my gosh. I mean, right there. Love must be sincere. It can't be fake. Love must be, it's got to be something that the opposite of sincere would be just everybody pretend you love each other. Let's all just act in love. It's like, no. If you really know God, if you've really been saved, if your mind has been transformed, and you understand what is going on between darkness and light, you understand your role, and you're going to submit yourself to God's plan and be more concerned about others than you are yourself because your role here is to serve and help advance the kingdom of God. Okay, now you're getting close. Now your love is sincere. It's not, I have no idea, I haven't read anything, I don't know anything, I just got saved like yesterday, but we're all supposed to be nice and put up with each other. It's like, so I love you, and smile. It's like, no, that's not, no, no, go away, go, to, go back to Sunday school class and, and, and figure this out. But you don't just come in and put a smile, we love each other, we're a church of love. It's like, yeah, most of that time that ends in some kind of a bonfire. No, no, right here, demand for love is you, you have, well, here it says, love must be sincere. If it's not sincere, Quit acting like it. Hate what is evil. Cling to what... Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Love must be sincere. And the first thing about sincere love is you hate evil. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. But tone it down, pastor. We're a church of love here. We don't hate anything. We hate evil because we're a church of love. It's like, oh, I don't like this place. This isn't very Christian. Right, because your love's not sincere. It's plastic. It's a smile. It's fake. And so evil comes in door. We love it too because we don't want to be judgmental. No, love must be sincere. And the first thing sincere love is going to do is hate evil. Hate forgeries. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. There's a key phase of love. Never be at lacking in zeal, but keep yourself your spiritual fervor. Now, again, that's a, I mean, I, I'm going way in too deep here, but listen. Never be lacking in zeal. That is an enthusiasm. That means passion. That means energy in what you're doing and how. And the thing is, you know, eventually you run out of zeal. Tony knows. We, I, run out of zeal. Don't nod your head too feverishly. But it's like, Tony's like, What? It's Tuesday. I got Bible study again tonight. Oh, and then you suck it up and you go. But how, what, how do you keep going? Well, right here. Never be lacking in zeal. Okay, get yourself fired up. Go, go, go. No, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Once again, you keep your ideal on this. You understand your part. You understand what you're doing. You let God, again, thinking more about chapters 1 through 11 than doing this because chapter 1 through 11 gives you the grace, the power, the information, the, the indicative, the information that, that keeps your spiritual life alive and you can keep going. Sure, you get tired, but there's something bigger happening here than just your energy. It's God is re-energizing re re you. Uh, there's a better word for that. But anyway, I'll talk about this later. But never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. And now where are we at? Demand for love, right in here. Demand for love, chapter 9, 12, 1 through 21. Because there is persecute love. Bless those who persecute you. That's getting in towards this right here. We talked about it. Uh, somewhere we were talking, I don't see it on the board here, but you're going to have people, uh, oh, the groups of people. You're going to have Christians that you're working with. You're going to have the world that you've got to be loving, and that world sometimes is going to be persecuting you because they don't agree with you, they don't understand you, so you hate them back. Well, no, you've got to continue to reach out for them, and then there's going to be the government. So here we enter that part right here where it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. 
Do not repay evil anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone and or everybody. Paul or Peter says that also. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If if you can do it. Now again, some people aren't going to put up with it. Some are going to want you to compromise. But as far as you can go, your goal is to be at peace with everyone. They are not your enemy. Again, Ephesians 6, the armor of God. We do not our wage war against flesh and blood. There's a bigger force going on. And so the people that are on the surface that you see are not your enemies. They're people that have a different worldview. They've got a different opinion. They've been caught up into the, the darkness of this age or something. They're the ones you're trying to rescue. You go back to Jude. They're the ones you're trying to rescue from the fire. They're the ones you're trying to save. They're not the ones you're fighting. You're fighting the forces of darkness behind their philosophies, behind their, their, their idols. But again, some they're going to manifest in such a way that there's nothing you can do. You're just going to have to walk away. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. There will be wrath, but it's not going to be Galen's wrath. God will bring the wrath. I'll just do my job and move on and walk away from the situation if I have to. But wrath is coming. Uh, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. There's this scripture. It says, right, that God, God tells you right in, I'm going to take care of this. I will, First Thessalonians says it too. God will even the score. Your job is to just keep doing what is right and duck when they swing at you. In doing this, you will keep burning, or if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, chapter 13, there we go. That's that part that I was talking about that is unique. That's right. We don't see this anywhere in Paul's right. Easy to defend in, in the Old Testament. Easy to defend with Paul, by Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. Easy to see in the book of Acts. We can see it in Peter's writing. So this is not like radical. It's just no place else we find it like this in Paul's writings. And then again, this is kind of interesting for, uh, for our own culture, our own time. Chapter 13, verse 1. Everyone must, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. And then when it's talking about established, that means the position of king has been established. Does that mean every king God, that takes that position God has put there? I think we could push it even that far. God, uh, God puts or allows every leadership, every leader to be in every position. Uh, again, there's a thousand things we could go off on this. Uh, you can see God putting good leaders in position because the people deserve a good leader scripturally I mean I'm thinking of scriptural examples you can see God bringing poor leaders saying the people are in rebellion here deal with this leader and that leader takes them to a place of judgment and they follow him and God smokes the nation it's like what was that about judging the people which is like if you believe in God well that was the old that was the Bible times wouldn't that be nice if that was the Bible times we could create our own fantasy world today the Bible times is still today times God is still here God is still in control. And God is going to raise up leaders and bring about leaders, sometimes to deliver a nation, sometimes to take a nation right to the slaughterhouse. And that's, again, that's why it says, well, let's read on. So this, this verse, everyone must submit to himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except for that, except God has established. So first of all, the position of king or president or judge or governor was established by God. The, the concept of government was God's idea. God established government. It says men will now rule men after the flood. And so the, the top is established, and the top rule was, oh my gosh, I'll save this for later. But the top rule was established. You see, I'm not. I'm going to save for later, but I'm not. He says, if man sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. In other words, how much authority does government have? Well, let's start at the very top. If someone under the government that the government's responsible to kill somebody, then that government is responsible to kill the person that killed the other person. They're there to kill or execute the murderer. It's like, whoa, what's that? Well, that's Genesis. That's God establishing government. And, and what about speeding loan tickets? Well, okay, and everything else under murder. I mean, we're assuming murder is the worst, and government covers everything underneath that. Well, what did Jesus think about that? Jesus agreed with him. He, he talked the same way. He tells Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword, die by the sword. What's he mean? Peter, 
You just cut off the high priest servant's ear, Peter. Uh, this is not going to go over well in the papers. The media is going to tear this apart. Here, picks the ear up, puts it back on his head, put your sword away. That's not what we're going to do here. Because if it would have, Peter just became what? When Peter drew, I'll save you, Lord, and he attacks the government. Peter's now a criminal. And he says, Peter, those who live by the sword, criminals, will die by the sword, the government. Criminals have a sword in, 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 in violence and rebellion. The government has a sword for control, for legal, for, for law, for order. So those who live by the sword as a criminal will die by the sword of the government. Put it away. Sorry, sir, about your ear. Okay, you're arresting me. Let's continue. And that's exactly what happened. So what did Jesus think of capital punishment? He says, Paul or Peter, they're going to kill you. Paul's appeal, if we see we can read in Acts, his appeal was to the governor. He says, if I've done anything worthy of death, I do not refuse. If I am guilty of a capital crime, what can I say? You have to kill me. It's the law. But it's not. The Jews are fighting a petty fight with me about crossing some kind of line on their temple mount. This is not a, a matter of life and death. But Paul himself in other places, we see him saying, if I'm worthy of death, execute me. But I don't think you've got that kind of a case here. I crossed a boundary line, they think, which I didn't do. And it was a matter of life and death. So, this ideal of government with complete authority, Genesis, goes all the way through the Old Testament, picks up by Jesus, picks up by the, in the book of Acts, and it's continued to the end of Paul's writings. So it's not like, well, that was Old Testament. The government was established by God. Well, let's read this. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for that. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. <laughs> consequently, <laughs> consequently. So since God has established the government, consequently. He who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And maybe your entire culture if you keep going. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, me, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of one in authority? <laughs> I'll give you some advice. Then do what is right. Sounds like me talking to my kids. <clears throat> and he will commend you. <clears throat> for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. The reason they've got the sword is from the very beginning is for capital punishment. So if you've decided to rebel against the government and unravel all the things the government is trying to do, don't think they've got that sword of authority just for decoration. They bear the sword from the very beginning for executing people who are bringing chaos into the society. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant and agent of wrath. Now, who brings wrath? God brings wrath. And the government is a servant that God uses to bring about his wrath in time. He is a servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So there's two reasons for you to obey the government. One, you'll get along with them. And number two, it's the right thing to do. Remember the, uh, the, the, the is it the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, and it will go well with you and you'll live long on the earth? That, if I can sum that up this way. If you can learn, if mom and dad can train a child to honor the authority of mom and dad, then that child will leave the home and go to the school and understand the teacher and the school authorities have authority and it will go well with them. And everything in life will fall into place because they've learned how to deal with authority. They've learned to listen to mom and dad. They've learned to listen to the coaches, listen to the teachers. They learned to follow the police officers. They learned the government system. They can cooperate and function as a successful member of society. It will go well with them meaning they'll be wealthy and successful in their society and they'll live long in the land because no one's going to kill them because of rebellion. And it starts with when they're two, three, four. And if parents fail to teach children to understand the authority, I'm the dad, you listen, 
and they hand that off to the teacher, oh my gosh, it, it, it turns into a cycle. Then you got a whole generation of people that don't understand that. Then you've got what we call, I think we call that the fourth generation, which is another story. Okay, then it goes on in verse 6. This is also why we pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what that you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So when the police officer pulls you over, you owe him respect. You owe him honor. Okay. Then, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding uh, except for the continuing debt of love. We return here to the concept of love, love fulfilling the law. Um, love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. In other words, if you can, one of the reasons why the Christian world does not need the Mosaic law is because they're functioning with this concept. They're honoring each other. They're honoring their society. They're functioning in different societies. Again, the law of Moses was established to not just have society function, but also it was their, it was their religion and their governmental laws. We go off on that more. And here it is. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not co covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself, which is a quote right out of Leviticus. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, all he's doing is quoting the Old Testament. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do, do this understanding the present time. Here it is, right here, talk about a way. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to, be, to wake up from your slumber. Now he's talking about being aware of eschatological events not getting sucked into the culture and the, these times as if these are the most important things because something bigger is to take place. He's not saying that the, Jesus' return is in his lifetime. It's just we, we continually, from this day forward, are always living awake. We talked about this in the Titanic Faith series. Is you're always looking and anticipating Jesus' return, knowing there's something bigger that we're living for. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Again, this is 57 AD. So 57, oh, I don't want to do the math here. Paul saved 35, 45, 55, 22. Paul's been saved 22 years. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. That'd be interesting. Go to Ephesians 4 or 6. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord. This sounds like Colossians. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think of how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You're not living here to have your best life now because if you have your best life now, that gives you a very, very bleak future because you're supposed to have your best life then. You're a servant living in a dark age at this time. If you're having your best life now, then you really haven't read chapters 1 through 11. You really don't understand what's going on. Okay, verse chapter 14, that's where we begin this, and I'll wrap it up. I'm about ready to wrap it up. We kind of covered everything here that we're going to have to go through. Chapter 14, this is now about the weak and the strong. The weak are those who are Christians, but they don't have Bible knowledge. I, we could say that. They don't have the apostolic revelation. They have, they're still struggling with, should we follow the Mosaic law, or should we be, do these things to make God happy? Do you really understand your salvation? And those who are strong are those who have an understanding of what Paul has been saying. And they're not going to get caught up like we see in Colossians, where they're getting caught up on special days and special feasts and special meals and, and all these special rituals. It's like, no, no, set that aside. We're walking in the light. Accept him whose faith is weak, because everyone's faith is weak. And this is not, I don't think talk about weak faith. I'm going through really tough times right now. My faith is really weak. I think we're talking about people as far as they don't really know what they believe. They've accepted Jesus Christ. And realize, when someone accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, okay, they're, they're, they're welcome to the church. They're welcome, you're born again. What do you feel about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? It's like, I don't know. Well, if you don't believe that Jesus was born a virgin, he can't be God, and so your faith isn't real. It's like, oh, I, I don't know. I, 
I'm still struggling if Muslims and Christianity still worship the same God. I don't know. I, is, there only, is there only one God? It's like, are you a Christian or not? Uh, yeah, I was, but I don't know about... What do you think about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? Do you think there's going to be a millennium on the earth, or is there just an millennium happening right now? What, uh, what is that at Mill? Is that a breakfast? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you're not a real Christian. It's like, okay, wait. They're coming in, except him whose faith is weak. They're, they're just trying to wrap their mind around some things. And so you can, you can nail me. You can ask me a question right now. I'd be like, I don't, I don't know if you thought of that. Well, he's not a real Christian. Okay, so except him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Again, there are some things that are not disputable, but there are some things that we really don't know. I mean, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, is there even a rapture? I've got my opinions, but it hasn't happened yet. Talk about it, put your bets down, draw your charts, and let's see what happens. But you can't separate on that. Uh, there are some things you, again, okay, I go on, I don't want to get taught too far in this, going on. One, man, one man's faith, now this is strange stuff right here. One's man, one man's faith allows him to eat everything. But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. And the concept there is the man whose faith is weak is still influenced by worldly thinking like of religions, like there's certain unclean foods, special holy days, certain rituals, and I've got to follow this kind of this legalistic pattern, and you really have got weak faith. You really don't understand the Christian doctrine. But him who understands, like, like Paul, Paul has no trouble with these things. This is what the first Jerusalem council was about, or the first church council was about. Man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For example, you go to a church potluck and one guy's down in pork chops. Like, these are great pork chops. The other guy said, well, we don't eat pork chops in our house. We follow the Mosaic law. It's like uh, we're very close to Yahweh. And, uh, we, and they got all these Jewish terms. And they're like, and you're looking at it, it's like, and you're wiping barbecue sauce off your face. It's like, man, you're crazy. This is good stuff. He's going, we don't want to be part of this worldly behavior. It's like, this ain't worldly behavior. These are pork chops. But they go off and say, well, you know, our family, we're separate. We're living over here. We only speak Hebrew at home or whatever, you know. And it's like, what? Okay, you're arrogant and ignorant, and you're over here. You say, well, those people, it's like work. I mean, that's, that's one of the church struggles is everybody kind of work at different levels of understanding, different levels of faith. And you see, that's going to go on and on and on, and you see all this. And that picks up also... 1 Corinthians, it's a big deal. It, it's, it's not so much a big deal. It can be applied in our, our world today, in our, our Christian world today. But for them, you can see he spends all this time here in Romans. And look at 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Two whole chapters, or eight, three chapters, he's talking about food, sacrificed idols. You remember this part right here. Foods, because it was a big deal. People are stumbling over. Because now you don't just have Jewish law in Corinth. You've got temples. And you've got, and a, like I said, I'll quit with this. But that in Corinth, the temples were like uh, the restaurants or, or the bars. It's like you go to a bar. It's like, we, we don't go to bars. It's like, well, we're, 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 we're going to go have something to eat. Well, the family's meeting at the bar. It's like, well, we don't. We're Christians. We don't go to a bar. And that's like saying here, they're going to, the families would meet at a temple, a, a, a pagan temple. And they'd have... They'd have birthday parties at a, at a temple. They'd rent a room. They'd have a little, their god statue would be there or something. That was their call to say, that's really not right. But the, that was Corinth. They're pagans. And so now the people become, half the family becomes Christians, and we're going to go to some niece's birthday party. They even had children's birthday parties. They still have invitations on papyri that are in the, you know, invitations to so-and-so's birthday party at the temple of so-and-so on such and such a day, and they still got remains of these birth, birthday invitations. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with them, except they're at a temple. But it was their culture. So now you become Christians. It's like, do we go to the temple? Do we not go to the temple? And it's like that's what this is all about. Trying to answer these questions. How close can we come? We're not trying to compromise. We just want to do what's right. Then they're handing the meat comes out the back door and it's sold at a restaurant, and you got the full cycle. Can, that meat can end up on your table anyhow. I don't even know where it came from. It's like, oh my gosh. I just, all I can do is grow my own garden and eat the carrots so I don't violate some kind of... And Paul's saying here, it's like, relax, take a breath. He says, idols are nothing. Not just, just, if someone, you just eat the food. They set it in front of you, eat it. Don't let them slide a steak across the table. And then you ask, excuse me, was this offered at the temple? He says, don't ask, don't ask, don't tell, basically. Eat the steak. 
Now, if they say, here's a steak from the temple of Zeus, and they're all thinking, oh, if you eat it, you're worshiping Zeus, then maybe you should say, I'll just have the salad. But if they just slide across and make no issue of it, eat the steak. So, I mean, I mean in other words, you've got, to be, you've got to read the situation, who you're trying to affect. And that's all, I mean, so it's a big deal. And we'll get into that eventually here. That's the introduction of chapters 12 to the end of the book. And then chapter 16, Paul sends a bunch of greetings to everybody. But again, it's important to kind of stop right here and say we've made a transition. Especially this is completely different than 9, 10, and 11. And you get a different tone from chapters 1 up through chapter 8. We'll pick this up in chapters, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Start breaking those verses down here next week. Thank you for your time and your patience. Father, we thank you again for the chance to look into these things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We do us that we take these things and handle them diligently, and then we'd allow them to manifest in our lives, in our thoughts, in our deeds, and the very attitudes we present. Again, Father, we thank you again for saving us and redeeming us, and ask that we would understand this and rejoice in this every moment of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.